Greetings students, welcome to chapter 15, the chromosomal basis of inheritance. So in our last uh, chapter we looked at meiosis and in that section we recognized that these factors that Mendel talked about, um, you know, they behave in ways that suggest that, or the chromosomes behave in ways that suggest that those factors are on them. And, and so we could explain Mendel's laws of segregation, Mendel's law of independent assortment, um, based on the movement of chromosomes during meiosis. Um, still, you know, correlation does not imply causation, right? So is there a way to actually demonstrate and prove that yes, in fact, Mendel's uh, factors are on chromosomes? That's what this section is about. And our journey begins with a lad named Thomas Hunt Morgan. This is back in 1910. And, um, you know, it's subtle in this picture, but it turns out he worked with fruit flies. Um, so Morgan kind of stumbled upon something that we now call sex-linked genes. These are genes located on a sex chromosome. And you probably remember that there's two sex chromosomes, the X and the Y. Um, which do you think has more sex-linked traits, the X chromosome or the Y chromosome? Did you say X? I hope you said X. Um, the reason why is because, remember, the Y chromosome is teeny tiny. It's only got about 100 genes on it, while that X chromosome has, you know, a couple thousand genes on it. So mostly when we talk about sex-linked traits, we're talking about the X chromosome. Um, that's not to say there aren't Y-linked traits. Males, for example, being a male <laughs> is a Y-linked trait. Um, if you have a Y chromosome, you are a male, um, biologically at least. So, um, so, but most of the traits we're going to look at are actually X-linked. So here's what Thomas Hunt Morgan did. So he worked with fruit flies. And you may wonder, why would you work with fruit flies? It turns out they're actually very, uh, very good organisms for genetic process. They're small, they're easy to handle and manipulate, and uh, they reproduce quickly and produce lots of offspring. So you can get a lot of offspring very quickly. Um, later we'll talk about how you can use this little chemical to like knock them out, and then like they go to sleep, and then you can like sort them out into piles. It's very interesting. But we'll get into that later. Um, so here's what Morgan did. You'll notice that he had different variants. There were some fruit flies that he noticed had red eyes, and then other fruit flies that he noticed had white eyes. And he would like hunt for these little variations in uh, phenotype so that he could do crosses with them. So he said, all right, let's try it. So he took a uh, red-eyed female and crossed it with white-eyed males. So red-eyed females, white-eyed males. And notice these symbols, um, that little circle, with it's kind of like a stick figure with no legs. Um, that is kind of a universal symbol for a female. And then this little circle with the arrow, um, kind of pointing at a 45-degree angle. 45 degree angle. That's, uh, that's a male. Anyway, um, so he did this cross, and lo and behold, all of the offspring had red eyes. So nothing too surprising here. Um, hopefully this tells you that the red-eyed trait is now dominant. And so then he said, all right, well, let's just... Do the, do the Mendel thing, let's, um, let's cross a F1 red-eyed female with an F1 red-eyed male and see what happened. And so, um, you know, as you'd predict, he certainly, sure enough, got a three to one ratio of three red eyes to one white eye. So again, nothing surprising with that F2 ratio, except when he looked closer at that three to one ratio and he broke it down by sex, what he found was that all of the females had red eyes, but half of the males had red eyes. The other half had white eyes. In fact, the only F2 offspring that had white eyes were males. That's weird. So what the heck is going on? How did, uh, how did Thomas Hunt Morgan explain this? Well, he concluded that the eye color trait must be carried on the X chromosome. And if that's the case, then the, uh, the males only have one copy of this allele because they only have uh, one X chromosome, the others being the Y, and the Y doesn't have that allele. And this was the first experiment to actually demonstrate that Mendel's factors were actually carried on these chromosomes and, and confirm what was already suspected based on the movement of chromosomes during meiosis. 
So let's kind of take a look and break this down and see how that would work. We're going to switch to the dot cam. So we have this new notation now um, when working with sex link traits. We use these superscripts. So here we have an X plus and an XW to represent the traits to indicate that they are in fact carried on the X chromosome. So X plus means red eyes, XW is white eyes. And when writing out the parents, remember that, that uh, first parental cross we did had a, a red-eyed female crossed with a white-eyed male, and the red eye was, in fact, a true breeding red-eye female. So she was homozygous. So we'd represent that. We always start with sex and chromosomes by writing out the actual XX, XY. Um, so female is the XX, male is the XY. And then we use our subscripts or superscripts as appropriate. So if it is a true breeding red-eyed female, she is going to be X plus, X plus. And then we have a true breeding white-eyed male, and so it's going to be X, W like that. Now notice that the Y doesn't get a superscript because, again, this, this gene is not carried on that Y chromosome. So now you fill out the Punnett square just like before. It's going to be law of segregation. Meiosis will separate these X pluses into separate gametes, and there's a 50-50 chance of getting an X plus and a 50-50 chance of getting the other X plus. And then for males, it's the same way. 50-50 chance of passing on the XW, 50-50 chance of passing on the Y. Only interestingly, in this case, this also is going to determine the sex of the offspring as well. So then you fill it out. Right. And lo and behold, you get 100% red-eyed offspring in the F1 generation, which is precisely what Thomas Hunt Morgan figured out. Now let's do the F2 cross. So let's just take these two offspring, for example, and do a cross with them. So I'll start a new Punnett square. I'll make my little box here. And then we're going to take this F1 female, and we put her on one side of our Punnett square, that's a W. <laughs> we take our male and put him here, and this, by the way, is our F2 generation, and we fill it in. X plus, X plus, X plus, XW, X plus Y, XW, Y. And if you look at this ratio, that's gone. If you look at this ratio, lo and behold, you see we get a 3 to 1 ratio of red eyes to white eyes, and all the white-eyed offspring are male. So this model perfectly predicts what Thomas Hunt Morgan found. So now what I want to do is I want to solve uh, another problem. And so here's an example of kind of a typical sex link trait problem that you might go, uh, that you might have. So a woman is a carrier for colorblindness, a recessive sex link trait. She marries a colorblind man. She becomes pregnant with a daughter. What is the probability that she is colorblind? What is the probability that she'll have a colorblind son? So it may be helpful if you don't have the PowerPoint uh, for this pulled up. It may be helpful to, to kind of have that available so you can kind of look at the problem um, and toggle back and forth between the screencast and the problem and kind of see what I'm doing here. So um, let me switch to the doc cam and we'll go ahead and solve this problem. Okay, so the problem said that we have a woman who is a carrier for the colorblind trait. What does that mean? A carrier is someone who's going to be heterozygous, meaning she doesn't express the trait herself, but she does carry the allele. And so her genotype is going to be X plus XC, meaning she is a carrier. She has the allele, but her phenotype is typical vision. She marries, this is a family show, so naturally traditional marriage will be part of it. Um, uh, she marries uh, a, what is it, a colorblind male. And then it says, what is, uh, and then it says that they have a daughter. What is the probability that this daughter is going to be colorblind? So what we're going to do is we're going to fill in this Punnett square. So just like before, X plus XC, 
x c y plus plus x c x c x c x plus y x c y. Okay, so there's our Punnett square, and then it says they have a daughter. What is the probability that she is colorblind? So if you look at the Punnett square, you see that here is a typical daughter, here is a colorblind daughter. So these two are males. So if they tell you she, they have a daughter, we already know that these two um, possibilities are not reality, right? They can't, she, it can't be this one. So basically we have two choices. It is this or this if we know already that she is a daughter. So the answer to that first part is going to be 50%. Because um, again, we know that these two offspring can't possibly, or these two genotypes can't possibly uh, be appropriate for this offspring. Now, the next part of the question asks a slightly different thing. It says, what is the probability that they will have a colorblind son? In other words, there's not an offspring already in existence. They're just sort of asking, in general, what's the chance of a colorblind son? So in this instance, since we don't know that you know any potential future offspring is a male or female, now the whole Punnett square is in play. What is the chance of having a colorblind son? Well, here is our colorblind son, and it is a 1 in 4, or 25% chance. So it's important how the question is asked. If they tell you they have a daughter, what is the chance that she's colorblind, then you can ignore this, the sons. But if they just say, what is the chance of a colorblind son, then we aren't ruling out the daughters right away, it's, so then, then we all four are in play. So that throws some kids off. So pay attention to what is being asked and how it's being asked. And now we're back to this problem that we just solved. Again, since I'm guessing most of you ignored me when I said pull up the slideshow, um, here's that wording again. She becomes pregnant with a daughter. What is the probability that she was colorblind? And then what is the probability that she'll have a colorblind son? So the way that it's worded matters. So that's it for sex-linked traits. Um, as always, solving problems is super important to make sure you understand this. So engaging with that homework packet is going to be key. Good luck.